My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for watching or tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. My guest today is Marquise Trent. Marquise, thank you for joining me. I hope you're doing well today. Um, how are you doing? Well, thanks, Dave. I'm doing great. Um, it's been a rock and roll over the last few weeks. Uh, March has definitely been challenging, but considering uh, the circumstances, yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Let's get started with your background. I mean, for those who don't know you and never heard of you before, you, your area of, of expertise is basically the effects of gangster music on culture, trauma, and its effects on people in culture. And your experience goes pretty far back. So can you start with how you basically how you got exposed to gangster rap music in the beginning, what happened and then how it impacted you and, and, you know, kind of take it from there. Awesome. Awesome. So born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, my personal story, my signature story, uh, like Les Brown and many other speakers, ET the hip hop preacher has his signature story. And my story is I was raised good, but the streets bad. Because full of a stable upbringing to the degree. And I've learned that there's degrees. Dysfunction comes in degrees. Poverty comes in degrees. Trauma comes in degrees. So a lot of times what we as people, we try to do black and white, but there is no black and white. There's, there's really that sh those shades of gray. Uh, I was born into dysfunction. When I was born, my parents were separated. Although I know my father, you know, so I was born into dysfunction. To know there's many different things in my family, from alcoholism to crack cocaine and things of this nature. With a Christian background, you know, we go to church, mom will take you to church and all that. We parted on the Saturday before we went in on the Sunday. So, to me, the city and the surrounding counties, uh, I recall gunshots going off all the time. And we might be playing in the living room, and then you got to get down because a stray could come through the window. Mothers, I won't single her out. Now, in the middle of, 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 of four of six housing projects in Richmond, you know. Okay, let's... You know, this way project, this way project, that way project, this way project. Even just chilling on her porch before I jumped off the porch, all you see is police. All you hear is ambulance. All you hear is gunshots. You see the tricks. You see the, the dope boys walking back and forth. So the young child involved in it, I witnessed it. You know is that life is life until you find out that it should be that way, if that makes sense. Right. Let me take a, a, a brief pause for one minute. I want to see if I can... Uh... Okay. So, Marquise, I'm sorry that we had the little sound guffaw there. So, how old were you? Do you remember how old you were when you heard the gunshots and you, you know, you saw the, you know, the guys walking around in the hood and everything? Oh, yeah. Uh, like your earliest 90s. memories. Yeah, early 90s. I say 7, 8, 9. Mm. 
seven eight nine. Um, one of my favorite locations of our family. Uh, we've long since moved from there. It's in Northside Richmond. Uh, I vividly that that one always sticks out. You know how we would be uh, in my aunt's house. There was a den, so you go in the house and you turn right and you go in the back and you go down like two or three steps and there's a den, big screen TV, radio, and we would always play. But there were these two windows that was on the front street. And there were some apartments over here and, uh, you know, small apartments right here. And that, that one almost always sticks out whenever I think about that situation. Wow. We were sitting there mm. dancing around and stuff and you hear multiple shots going off. And my aunt would just, yeah, y'all get down, y'all get down, you know, from underneath the window because, you know, it's natural strays fly wherever they may. Right. So, I mean, what happened after that? I mean, obviously that had an effect on you, whether you knew about it at that time or not. You probably didn't because yeah. you're just a kid. So what happened? How did, did you get involved with actual gang activity? Do you remember listening to gangster rap when you were a kid? I mean, did you just get what happened and why? Absolutely. So being around certain things in a general sense is going to start to affect you. Um, I didn't listen to a lot of up north music, but yeah, I did listen to down south music, certain artists and things of that nature. But I jumped off the porch, as they say, in 2000 and 2000. So I was 15. So but just to go back, though, this this is this is the interesting thing about that. I was sipping the liquor. I would go around and find, you know, my sister and I would find stashes and drink drink liquor we would smoke old cigarettes we were we were modeling what we were seeing you know right. uh various sexual activities and things of that nature you know drinking beer at eight years old you know trying to drink a full cup just to show that i'm tough because i kept asking for it which i definitely want to hit on when we start talking about the music because you generally do what you see right so although i had gangsters in my family i've come to find out they didn't glorify that type of lifestyle around us. Now they would drink, they would cuss, they would talk trash, they would smoke cigarettes, they would drink their corn liquor. But we didn't hear about, oh, uncle such and such or such and such is, you know, he did this to this person and did that. They didn't glorify that before. That was one of those, you know, they handled business when it needed to be handled. The children don't need to know about that type of stuff. So I can appreciate that. But as I've grown older, all of the stories come back and we're like, oh, yeah, such and such did this. Yo, I don't want to incriminate nobody, but family members that I grew up around, oh, she did this to this woman. And I'm like, what? So, like, those type of things is, is a part of who you are. But go ahead. Do you, I mean, this might be a weird question, but, you know, I, in between jobs, you know, I worked for many different marketing agencies for a long time. And in between, I would work as a substitute teacher or a teacher briefly in, you know, all all over different cities. Do you remember as a child or teenager ever feeling, I wish I didn't have to do this or I just wish I could you know, do things differently, or did you just not know that you could? You know what I mean? I because I, if you talk to little kids, most yeah. kids don't know, you know, about drinking a 40 and, you know. It's, that's a, that is a, that is a weird question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. And I say I don't know because, it was life. You know, we saw the tangeray around. You know, we saw the corn liquor around. We saw, you know, the alcohol around. So if mama or uncle or whoever's doing it, it clearly should be an issue. They'll say, well, that's not for you. Right. And of course, yeah. as a child, you're like, well, why it ain't? Y'all drinking it. You know, so we would sneak little stuff. But the full-fledged, the full-fledged of experiences of all of that is like 14. 14, I started drinking. Uh, beer, malt liquor, uh, smoking weed at 15, sexually active at 15 years old, and everything started there and skyrocketed. So it was like the dibble dabbles at 8, 9, and 10, but you're talking about full immersion 
at 14, 15, 16. I'm in the hospital at 16 years old because I used to drink E and J uh, brandy straight like this and glasses like this. No, no lick, no soda, just ice and smoking a black. Well, you're a teenager. Your body's still growing. Right. You literally ate the lining in my stomach, which I couldn't enjoy Thanksgiving or Christmas because I drank so much. I didn't know that I had an addictive gene. I didn't know that alcoholism ran in my family. I didn't know that other members uh, were smoking crack and, 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 and getting high. And I didn't know that addiction was a part of my makeup. So it makes sense to me why it was so easy that I was fully immersed in it when I tried it instead of just, oh, it's okay. No, once I started drinking, I drank for like 10 years straight. Or, you know, I can't mm. even think right now, but easily eight to 10 years straight. Yeah. So now how did that transition to when you're a teenager? Because obviously that's going to have to escalate at some point. Absolutely. So 12 years old is when I remember writing my first rap. So, you know, I would listen to Crucial Conflict and uh, Sir mix a lot and, you know, some of the other artists and stuff back in the 90s, mainly what was on the radio. Again, my mom, she was more of the church goer. So she would have more like some oldies or something like that. So if one gospel music, it was uh, the oldies, but goodies, quiet storm. Stuff My like kind that. of music. Yep. Absolutely. I love smooth jazz. You know what I'm saying? I got it honest. Now, hanging out with my cousin and, and, and things of that nature, she, her mom was a little more relaxed. So she had a little more Tupac, Biggie, little gangster music like that, that you can hear the full, you know, so various peer groups that I had between family and others, that's where I got to really taste that music. But 97, I was listening to Bone, I wrote my first rap. That's when I fell in love with actually rapping myself. And that was well over 20 years ago. So at that time, I wasn't rapping crazy. Well, I take it back. When I first started rapping, I rapped what I heard them say. But I still tried to be honest with my raps. If I won't carry guns, then I won't going to say I was carrying guns. I didn't carry guns till I, I was a teenager, but I wasn't going to say that I'm shooting at people if I wasn't shooting at people. Right. So I can always be able to look in the mirror and say, at least you're keeping it real with yourself. So what eventually happened? I mean, did you get involved with gangs or did you stay away from them? No, I didn't get in gangs, but I, I Richmond has gangs, Bloods, Crips, and GDs. Uh, no VLs or nothing like that, but Latin Kings. Crips, no, I don't. I don't know of any Latin Kings. And mostly Richmond has Bloods, Crips, and Gangster Disciples. Okay. Uh, if there are any other sects, they aren't like openly known. But mostly Bloods, Crips, and GDs are the folk nation. So, gangs wasn't my thing, but I hung with people that. I hung with some of the people that I knew or found out later was affiliated or were members. But they didn't openly rock the flags and stuff. A few of my people got some rank in, in certain gangs. I don't want to say too much on that. A few of my folks do have rank in certain gangs, but gangs wasn't my thing. I just ran with the people that did dirt. I put in my own work. I did my own dirt for many years, and uh, I paid the price for it in many different ways also, psychologically, financially, and I do, unfortunately, have a, a record as well. So... So what eventually happened to the point where, you know, you could finally, life. yeah, you could finally find um, what they call in Buddhism, a middle ground, you yeah. know, where you're, uh, you're enjoying thousand. life, but you're not running on that, uh, what's yeah. that expression, the red, you know, the, the jagged edge, so to speak, you know. I would say um, I caught, so I caught, like, I don't want to do too, like, year specific for people to go do up, but. Um, I caught my first few charges early in the 2000s. Um, so closer to 2000 and mid 2000s. Again, I don't want to be too detailed for the, for the folk, but mid 2000s, I did get pulled over. Mm. And given the circumstance, given what was found, given my criminal background, all of that together should have, at a minimum, gave me five years. At a minimum, five years. But to me, my come to Jesus moment, as they say, that was that moment. 
I had been on probation for many years, uh, mm -hmm. having to piss for the PO, having to call to go to these places. I got tired. I was literally exhausted with being under the control of another person. Yeah. Uh, giving up your monies, your stashes, your savings to lawyer fees and in and out of court. Like that was like literally a period of like three, four years where it was just court investigation, court investigation, lawyer. <laughs> I got tired, man. So I was like, God, even though I came up like that, to me, I didn't see a full level of what I know to be godliness or Christianity or the kingdom. So to me, it was just religious stuff that my mom and them do. It won't really real to me. But at that moment, it was all faith. Well, I'm like, God, you know, if, if you know, I'm tired of this. So even though I don't really know how this go, I'm willing to live for you even if I go to prison. So if you give me at least a bond, because I'm not one of those people that cry to God when I get in trouble. I was wilding out. I was carrying guns. I was selling drugs. I was doing more stuff that don't need to be mentioned on camera with the people I was doing it with. So that's what it was. I'm not going to cry now. To me, it's like, what type of time is you on? Don't cry. You won't cry when you was masking up and running. Doing. You won't cry then, so don't cry now. That's not me. So I said, at least give me a bond. Let me get a bond. So I can get my affairs in order. Right. And it is what it is from there. And literally, no lie, bro. Um, I got six months probation. I mm -hmm. ain't rat on nobody. I ain't write no statements on nobody. I ain't wear no wires. I won't ride with the police pointing out people. All the type of fugazi stuff, you know, from the street standpoint that people will do to get their sentences reduced. You lucked out. <laughs> you really did. You lucked out. Um, cause yeah, you could have been enrolled in the I call it divine providence, but I right. Know. Right. I mean, you could have been completely enrolled in the criminal industrial complex as they call it. And, and once you get in, it's very hard to get out because as, as you alluded to, you have your probation officer, you've got other fees, um, there's so many different fees. And once you're late, now you pay the fine on top of the fee and you're going in on a weekly basis and you have to get tested to make sure you're not on anything. And it goes on and on oh, and man. on. So uh, that's that, that's good that you had that um, that divine intervention, as as you put it. So what happened after that um, in Absolutely. terms of? And I will say, man, uh, I'm very grateful because that's been 13 years. And I stand on that, and I'm very grateful. And I tell people I have been in 13 years myself because, you know, you build, you, you want to build something, you know. So after that, I went to school. I got, uh, I'm trying to, trying to follow my time. Oh, yep. So after that, I went to school uh, for massage therapy. Uh, did that for some time. Uh, life was going on in 2010, 11. I say about 2011 is 2012. Uh, I started dabbling in, in, in entrepreneurship in a positive light. So I uh, wrote my very first book, which I normally don't tell people about that one. That was sexual in nature, uh, <laughs> how to please women and stuff. That was my very, very first book. I co-authored that with a guy that I know. Uh, then I did start a, a t-shirt label. I sold some shirts, things of that nature. Uh, then I really started my, 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 my path of faith even stronger again in 2012. And that's when I wrote. I can show my book, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, absolutely. When I show, that's when I wrote. I started in 2014. I wrote my first book, Weapons of Mass Destruction. It's a 500-page nonfiction. So I started studying this uh, conspiracy theory stuff and just started to really open my eyes to a level of the world that I never knew existed. When I was fully immersed in that life, all it was was guns, money, drugs, sex, women, I mean, strip clubs, you know, just utter debauchery. I didn't really care about nothing of real substance. You know, I was fully immersed in this world. Uh, like uh, they used to say, your your nose was wide open. That's what they used to say. Oh, wow, man, it was wide. Right. So I mean, <laughs> it was wide open. I was wide open. What informed your ability to write that book that you just 
just showed because when we talk about a book that's one thing most people don't write books period and most people don't write a 500 page book because now you're talking like the stand or something i mean it's it, that's a a lot of work that goes into that a lot of organizing a lot of work what went into that and what was it about I, I mean, I say at a minimum, clearly, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a timer or nothing, but I'd say a thousand hours uh, of research, referencing, cross-referencing, triple cross-referencing, because one thing that I found, it really helped my my perspective on the world. One thing I learned, even with the culture of, of rap music, you know, and and I'll speak on that because one thing that I found was is one thing to to read about it, it's another thing to live it and be around it. And, and I'm going to speak on that, but to come back to it, when you're searching information, you think you know and you have a surface level knowledge. And a lot of times I would impose what I thought it was, I would start typing it because this is what I knew to be true. And then when I went and researched it, it wasn't so. Mm-hmm. So that really opened my eyes and my mind to be very careful and my opinions and what I'm saying and what I think that I know because it got flipped many, many times while writing that book. I want to research. Go ahead. I want to ask you, what did you cover in that book? I mean, when you talk about weapons oh, yeah. of, I mean, did you talk about uh, Project Mockingbird, mind control? I didn't go that deep. I, I didn't go that deep, even though I was into that. The average person ain't, ain't into all that. So to me, initially doing this was a, uh, wetting the whiskers of the individuals that really wasn't into that. Now, people like yourself, clearly, uh, Operation High Jump, Mockingbird, Montauk Project, uh, all that good juicy stuff, you and I could probably talk off camera about those things. Now, again, I started this in 14. That was seven years ago. The population is awakening even more, but back then, People won't even try to hear it. Like people ain't want to, bro. I ain't trying to talk about that stuff. I don't want to hear about that stuff. But what I talked about it uh, was there being an agenda in general, uh, propaganda. I talked about the origins of music. I talked about rock and roll, heavy metal, things of that nature. Right. Uh, Hip hop, rap, the effects of it on the generation. So this was the this this was the father of this book. Weapons of mass destruction get end up giving birth to this. I also talked about movies, the power of cinema, black exploitation, cult films, video games, violence in video games. I talked about pornography, the power of words, intention, subliminal programming. Those were the type of things that I talked about to give people a, a person who has no knowledge of any of these things. I wanted to bring them in to say, hey, maybe I can consider looking at this because the way that he's explaining it. When I look back out on the world, it kind of seems like it makes sense. Well, so far, you know, I got to be honest. It's a pretty inspiring uh, story so far. So what happened after you wrote the book or uh, maybe around that period of time? Absolutely. So when I wrote the book, I really started to to really get into speaking more. Uh, I was always known to to have a voice and have a way with words, gift the gab, and things of that nature, levels of influence. But I wanted to use it in a positive manner. So to bring it back, when I was when I was in the streets, when I was running the streets, when I was in in, in crack houses and 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 watching people smoke crack and shoot dope and 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 just the full experience. Like seeing people weigh, you know, multiple ounces of cocaine, you know, and just the full experience of this life, you know, this ain't the rap stuff, you know. So it's like when I hear rap music, it's one of those things because some people are good actors. Some Mm -hmm. people are good actors. Some people rap with a fervor. And a language and feel was like, oh, bro, was in the trap for real, you know. So, I ain't the hardcore gangster guy on the wire. That ain't me. Like I said, but I was the person that'll pull the trigger if I had to pull the trigger. I'm gonna fight with my people if I had to fight. I'm gonna ride for my people if I gotta ride. I'm loyal, so I'm down for the cause. But if we can talk about it, smoke it out, and then kick it, that would be cool too. 
But if it's time to rap, I'm going to rap. Again, I have put in work. I ain't going to be incriminating myself. But I'm saying all that to say, when I think about the music, I'm thinking about these young people that are glorifying. I'm sorry for the camera jumping. I don't know what's going on with that. But those young people, it's like they do what they see. They do what they're around. So when I have the opportunity to go speak in schools, I want to empower them to know, look, I understand what you're listening to, what you're watching, but I want you to know there is another level of life that is available to you. Because as you were saying, when you have that level of hopelessness, the trauma of hearing gunshots or seeing dead bodies or, you know, your mama smoke crack or, you know, she a trick. So, you know, depend again, levels, because even though certain people came up in the hood, their mama didn't smoke crack. Their mama wasn't a trick. So in my opinion, you can't downplay somebody's experiences or trauma because yours may have been to the highest level. I don't believe that that's a proper, uh, I can't think of the word, but I don't believe it's proper to say, well, you know, Dave, you ain't been through nothing if you ain't get shot. Or Dave, you ain't been through nothing if the police ain't beat you in your head. Who am I to say that? That's crazy. Well, you know, different people experience different types of trauma, too. You know, what mm-hmm. somebody in Bosnia or whatever might not have been involved in gangs, but they could go through a different type of trauma. Uh, you know, somebody who comes from an abusive family and just got, you know, uh, abused or, or what have you, they can't say that they were involved in gangs, but they suffered nonetheless. So, yeah, I don't believe in getting involved in some kind of competition when it comes to, you know, pain and suffering. Um, can, I, can I say something? Absolutely. Briefly? Absolutely. So with with that, but but this, that, that point, of reference that I just made is because as I did my own soul searching, as I done my own identity check, I had to say, so for instance, I'm an addiction and abuse recovery coach and going through my certification process over the last year, I had to do a whole lot of deep inner work and self-reflection. And as I began to recount and share with my coach, the things that I've been through, I was amazed like, wow, bro, like you, you really do have an extensive list of complex PTSD. Complex PTSD and PTSD, PTSD as you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm-hmm. but complex when you have PTSD and traumatic experiences that are frequent and high level mm-hmm. for long periods of time. So as I looked at all of the things that I've gone through and it was back to back to back to back to back to back, it explains various pockets of memory loss and uh, high alert, like it could go down because I've literally been in situations where we're having a conversation and your car is getting shot up literally in the next 10 seconds. You know, when you go through those things, they they form you. They, they reform you. So it's that process of, 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 of learning to relax, learning to drop your guards like my family, my children, they suffer from my PTSD, because I come from a world of violence where people do break in your house. People do pull up to your street while you're talking and shoot at you. Or, you know, these things can happen without warning. Ain't no smoke in the sky saying, hey, it's about to be a drive-by. I'm going to switch cameras. I'm... Okay, hang on. These is real experiences. But the reality of negatively affecting your children because of what you've been through is real. Now, so go ahead. When you say it negatively affected your children, I mean, without getting really specific, what are we talking about? Just not being available, not being interested. Well, that happens. But I'm talking about like how sometimes I would be like so overbearing on them about security. Make sure the door lock. Come on. What is you doing? Make sure the right. window lock. Come on. What is you doing? You came in the house. Why don't you close the door behind you? Why don't you lock the door behind you? To the point where they like, all right, dad, like, okay. But it's like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> you don't get it. When right. you go you're, down, you go down. And yeah, you're water. remembering things that you had experienced yourself. So you're looking at them and saying, hey, I know that if you don't close that door and lock it, someone could walk in and it, it it's probable and you know 
So you're kind of reacting to that. And anybody who spent any time in those types of situations is going to react that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, that makes sense. I I lived in uh, in Baltimore for several years, and I still remember that. I still make sure every door is locked. I still, uh, you know, make sure, you know, what are we doing to make sure that if somebody wants to break in, they cannot do that or they're going to have a very rough time of it. Absolutely. Because if you live in Baltimore, you see that, at least in the area that I lived in, you you would see people trying to climb up the fire escape. <laughs> you, wow. You look out the window <laughs> and you see somebody piece, waving man. to you like this. You know, I'm just trying to break into your car. Hi, mister. Better make sure you lock that um, the car up. <laughs> I remember going to yeah. run an errand once, and I just left my car unlocked for like 10 minutes to go run somewhere and grab something. I came back down. The radio was gone. The tires were jacked off the car. Everything. 10 minutes. They were fast. <laughs> but if that doesn't oh, educate man. you to lock your car uh, all the time, nothing will. So you always make sure you don't, you do not let your hood be up. You don't unlock your car. You don't drive yeah. with your windows rolled down. Cause they'll come, they'll come get you at the stoplight. And it, it's an unfortunate, like, and that, and and if we could dovetail a bit, sure, that's that's where my heart is, man. It's bigger than just saying, you know, to me, life just shouldn't be like that. Now, granted, you can't <laughs> right. save the world, you can't change everything, but to me, and and specifically, I'm not gonna make this a race thing, but I'm gonna speak from a, a person of, of you know, Black America. To me, I don't take pride in saying, oh, you better not go to such and such in Baltimore. You might not make it out. You better not go to Jackson, uh, Gilbert Court around Richmond. You bet. To me, I don't take pride in that. I don't think, and that's, that's why my goal is to shift the thinking of the culture with Lord Save My City, my clothing brand, and overstanding. Because it's like, come on, y'all. Do you, do you enjoy being the butt of the of the human race do you enjoy your women being considered thought white girls won't ever call thoughts thoughts in a general sense was the name given to black girls that were promiscuous that whole over there so when when i when i approach it it's coming from again that place of of reality i've been in strip clubs. i've been in strip parties not strip clubs in virginia and it's been many years since i've been to a strip club but in Virginia, the women would wear pasties. So Virginia, being a commonwealth, still had a level of morality where they could not get completely naked. I can talk like this, right? I'm fine. Okay. Okay. They would at least have on. I just want to be sure. We'll make they it explicit. Have... We'll make this episode explicit. Go right ahead. Okay, cool. I mean, I'm, I'm going to still use tact because of my, my position, but. You know, in Virginia, women would still have to have on thongs or G-strings and pasties. Now, up north in New Jersey or possibly Baltimore, D.C., especially in Atlanta, they can be completely naked. Well, in a strip party, ain't no rules. Right. So in the strip party, anything goes. So yeah. the girls would be naked. So to me, although prostitution and sex has been a, a long time commerce, I get it. I totally get it. Whatever. But my thing is, when you create a culture, businesses that are multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies flourish because of leadership, great culture. So when you have a culture of disrespect for your women, then that creates a certain cesspool, so to speak, mm -hmm. because the women are going to affect the young boys because the women give birth to the boys, which then... If the father's leaving for whatever reason, we 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 continue to perpetuate this cycle. So my my cry is, look, y'all, I get it, but how about we consider looking looking and living this way? Why? Because I don't want to hear you complain about a situation. This is my biggest thing. Don't continuously complain about situations that you aren't willing to take the step in the direction to change. That's it. Don't complain about vigils. I've spoken at so many vigils 
of, of people that have been gunned down. Some I do know, some I don't know. Uh, the last vigil I spoke at, the boy was 17 years old, gunned down in the middle of one of the most notorious projects in Richmond. Now, I see literal multiple hundreds of people out here. The shooter could have been out there. Not even going to get into that. Don't sit here and scream and cry about, oh, they took such and such away. Oh, we need to stop this. But then you ride down the street bumping some of the most violent music toward your people that has ever been created. I have an issue with that. So you, that, That's my problem. I have an issue with that. Okay. So you feel that it's a fair statement to say that, hey, look, when you, when you play gangster rap, it glorifies violence. It glorifies the commoditization of women, the objectification of Absolutely. women. You're basically, there's no talk of relationships. I mean, that's more a whole other type of music completely. We don't, we don't even, I, I don't think, I can't remember hearing about that. I've heard about it on the stylistics, but that's not gangster rap. So no. not even close. So when did you start going and speaking to groups about it? And what do you think the effects are and, and what could be done about it? I say I began, uh, I've always spoken, but say my book was released in 2004. Well, the first book that came out in 18 and I started in 14. So even while I was writing, I was talking about it because when my mindset changed and I came into a new way of living in 2000, first it was 2008. When I caught that charge, I turned my life over to God. So when I caught the charge in 2008 for about two years, I was fully in the church. I was fully everything. God, Jesus, blah, blah. That was it. That was it. I don't want to hear about nothing else. 2011-ish, for about another year and a half, I was I was right back in it. Or as in the Christian faith, we call it backslide. So I bit backslid for about right. a year and a half, fully back into it. Uh, violence, bit, just craziness. So 2000, end of 2011, 2012 is when I was back on it, and, and I've been on that path ever since. So I've really had been talking about it since like 2012. Started writing a book in 14 talking about it even more specifically. So it's really been the last nine years. Now, a lot of people have been affected. You know, I was very heavy on Facebook. I mean, hours upon hours upon hours of Facebook lives. Uh, I was on the radio here in Richmond for oh, oh, about a year, uh, speaking about the same topic, uh, racial injustice and, you know, the whole nine. So I, I got a body of work. I got a body of work on, on speaking on these things. Some receive it, but a lot of people initially push back. And some of the same old lame to me, the same lame excuses is, well, it start with the home. It start in the home. And I'm just making fun because to me, that's ridiculous. Although it does, although it does, think about how much time children spend outside the home. If you're in school for eight, and I know this happened with my own children. If you're in school for eight hours times five, that's 40 hours a week that they're at school. You may put parental controls on their phone, but their friend, I've I, I, this, I lived this. I see my own sons. I walk up and I might hear some vulgarity come out the phone before they see me of their, their neighborhood friend. So it's like, yeah, I might block his phone. But what are they going to listen to when they go around their friends? Right. So to me, it's train, as the Bible says, train up a child in the way that they should go. So we teach our children the realities of these things, how they affect them, and we guard them as much as we can. But we have the full knowledge that this is a dirty world and they're going to be exposed mm -hmm. to something. So we give them the armor necessary to deal with it. So instead of embracing darkness, they can push it back. I got daughters. I don't want my daughters being called thoughts and it's okay to pop it and 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 and, 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 and bust it doing the bust it challenge, one of the most widely promoted things with the young lady Erica Banks or something, whatever her name is. You know, I want them to say, hey, that's not what we do. That's not what we do. Your body is important, 
you're you're matter you have worth you don't show yourself to the whole world like that just for some likes or something that's not what type of time that we own and that's that's what this means to me and it's ultimate and and you i don't want to put words in your mouth so you tell me if you disagree okay it's it's ultimately a destructive lifestyle <sighs> man when you promiscuity and and, and and i appreciate you sharing that because that's my goal just to shine the light on it you can say what you want you can think what you want but one thing i know about people we like to run from the truth as people mm-hmm. we don't want to face the reality of our decisions when you live in a world full of bastards no disrespect to nobody but when you have children out of wedlock over and over they're considered even historically bastard children right let's not play the game here so when you have women Black and white and Spanish that have one and two and three and four and five children out of wedlock, you tell me if that's healthy. You tell me as a man if that's going to be your first pick. If you had a woman, a whole flock of women lined up, 12 women, and and five of them is, is fine as wine, like, oh, my God, girl, Lord have mercy. All five of them got three and four children out of wedlock. Once you find out. Are you going to still be as enthusiastic? Personally, I doubt it. Not saying they're trash, not saying they're second rate citizens, but as a man, the core of who we are as men, if we are being real with ourselves, is to spread your seed, to to, to grow your legacy. So if just my perspective, if you had the choice to pick one that you can build a completely different family with, and start fresh, most men, in my opinion, would, would, would go with that. Mm-hmm. So when you create a culture and a in a in a in a lifestyle of promiscuity where you sleep with this guy tonight just because you feel good, the condom breaks, or you might not even use one now, you got a child. That's the reality of those choices. I've had one night stands. I've had many wild nights and I've had girls' hearts that I've broken. Now, I want no dog like dog them, but I was a player. I've had girls say, well, why weren't we together? Well, why didn't this go farther? Or you said I was the only one. Well, you sold me a dream. Like, you don't think that sticks with them? Yes, it does, because I've dealt with other females that give me the pain of other guys. So right. I have to deal with their baggage, which come from other guys doing that to them. So instead of a culture of monogamy, when the time is right, instead of a culture of monogamy and care and love and support, we got a culture of no new friends, which is music and tattoos, trust nobody, uh, YOLO, you only live once. I mean, no, the guys in the music don't even respect their women. They they call, How can I call my, my wife, you know, out her name? in a respectful manner. No, 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 no. It causes pain. It causes destruction. And if people be real with themselves, they will see the same thing too, in my personal, honest opinion. Now, I I don't know the specifics of the case, but as of April, what is it? April 6th today, I don't know uh, what the uh, status is of DMX. Now, I don't know if he'd be considered gangster yeah. rap or not. Uh, but I, I, and I, I can't speak to his life. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know if you'd consider him gangster rap or not. But back in the day, yeah, old school DMX was definitely. Uh, yeah, because I mean, not, not, not to cut you off. Watch this. Watch this. And I just want to say this since since you brought up him specifically. There was a segment in my book where I talked about rape, where I talked about rape. I was unaware how many rappers spoke about or glorified or put rape in their music. Now, when I was running with the gangsters that I was running with, as far as I know, that's all I can say. As far as I know, none of the people I ran with rape nobody. And it ain't something that you generally brag about. I know one of the guys that I know, you know, this, this is my homeboy. He's 10 toes down, le- legit gangster, the epitome of, of following the codes. Not just, wow, you ain't got no mind, but like literal old, 
it's it's rules to this thing. Mm -hmm. Real gangster. From my knowledge, he he ain't with he ain't with rape. Did you know that DMX had a song out? Sorry, DMX, but it, this is what I'm saying. I got to do my job, and I am praying for you. Did you know that DMX had a song out talking about raping a teenage girl on the floor? I had no idea. Yep. No it was idea. About if, if him and a guy got into a beef, I would come into the house and, you know, while you on the couch or slap you on the couch, rape your teenage girl on the floor and then look you in the face and say, what you going to do? In so many words. When I read it, I was like, oh, bro, like, what? I had no mm. idea. You know, so, 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 you know, these are the things, again, everybody just going to do this. And they're going to look the other way like they ain't hear that. But then we got daughters. We got nieces. We got cousins. We got wives. We got sisters. Like, is this okay? If it's okay, then just tell me it's okay. Then we can discuss it from that point of it being okay. But to act like it's not there, I just want us to wake up and say, let's, let's, let's look at this. So let's take it to today. No problem. When, when you go and you talk to different groups, do you talk about these topics or do you have a bulleted, you know, outline that you refer to? What exactly do you do when you speak? And then um, how do you do this on an ongoing basis? Is it like a career? Got you. So uh, lately I've been focused more on the coaching, but I'm putting together some things in the background to, to get into more schools because that's a, excuse me, that's more of a, that's work. I mean, that's the business of growing speaking. So having to look for these speaking engagements and things of that nature is work. So lately I've been a little more focused on podcasts because you get a wider audience and things of that nature. So to answer your question, yes, I do have actual signature speeches because I like to talk about identity. So one of my signature speeches is Identity 3.0, Return of the Kings. So in Identity 3.0, Return of the Kings, I talk about some of the things that I talked about. I talk about, uh, let's say, old uh, black people from, from times past, you know, when there was when there was more, now again, even in my books, I said there was always criminality. There's always been violence, sex, drugs. So I'm not saying that rap started any of that. I always kept driving that point home in both of my books. But what I say is that it glorifies and mass spreads the ideology across the culture. But when you look back at classic, I'm going to just say classic blacks. I can't think of a term. The Moors? For instance, Do you want to go, if uh, you want to go that far back, the Moors? No, 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 not that far back. <laughs> not at all, not that far back. But that's good. But I'm just talking about even in the last, uh, what's that, 50, 50, 50, 60, about 50 or 60 years. 50 or 60 years. So when you have people like Duke Ellington and, and uh, you know, those individuals, the Renaissance, would that be the James black Renaissance? Baldwin. Black individuals like that. Brilliant. There was more of a pride of black culture. That was more of a take care of our people of black culture that existed prior to the wave of gangsterism that hit the scene. So although things were never perfect, because even in my book, I talk about in the juke joints and the barrel houses, it was lawful, the unspoken law that a black person could kill a black person and not go to jail. So it ain't like there ain't never been no issues between the race. I'm not saying that. But my grandma, who has seen multiple generations, she's almost 90, she shared with me herself that things were much different in times past. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was, there was a pride that blacks had uh, about who we were as a people, and that was pre-segregation. Now, again, I'm of the philosophy that we are the human race and that we're more alike than we are different. Bottom line, the only thing that really separates people are their cultures, their traditions, and their languages. But at the end of the day, we're all the human race, period. 
Uh, but when you start speaking on those things, the reality of the, the class system that has been in America, blacks being rated second class citizens or less than, there was always a we all we got mentality. Mm -hmm. But when when you desegregated them and then instituted such music. So, again, hip hop started as a news channel for black culture. However, when certain individuals got their hands on it and commercialized it, I believe, even as we've seen with the movie CB4 and other types of exposés of certain people, those higher up start picking certain people to then become the entertainers. You got so many rappers that were like, oh, I don't even smoke weed. I don't even drink syrup. I don't even get drunk. I just make music. It's entertainment. So it's like, wait a minute. What you mean, bro? You make one of the best weed smoking songs I ever listened to, but you don't smoke. You made one of the best alcohol songs whenever I turn up, me and my people, we go get this drink so we can turn up to your song. You don't even drink? You don't pop pills? Like, to me, that's so misleading. When I stood on blocks in hand-to-hand transactions, we did drink. We did ride. We did load guns. We did everything that you talk about, but you didn't do it at all. Do you think that on some level these these guys were sellouts in a way, that they're basically taking this – saying that they were something that they weren't basically in order to get paid because yeah i've noticed uh lately there seems to be more and more of a trend of with 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 horror movies or tv shows where you seem to have more and more tv shows and movies that are of like a horror type of nature where they're they're trying to capitalize on the the negativity of racism in modern society like you had uh, get out us yeah. Um, yeah yeah what yeah. what are some some other ones you had that tv show lovecraft country i haven't seen that yet um but basically th- uh, and there was one with um antebellum with Janelle Monet i haven't seen that, was that. Amazing. That was amazing. I don't. That I don't know if I amazing. want to see it, but based on the reviews that I read, I'm not sure if I would want to see it. But yeah, I appreciate do- you for that. To be honest, uh, side note, I really appreciate your heart on, on that. Um, that really speaks to your character. In general, for a person to say something like one, it was a, it was a, from an entertainment presentation type, it was a dope movie. It was fire. It was a good movie. Okay. From a real life, look at what this really is saying. It was disturbing. It was heartbreaking. It was like in America, like what? It was. It was disturbing. It was. It was disturbing. So I appreciate you for that. I mean, do you think that that is a new trend that's similar to gangster rap in debasing, you know, basically the African American experience in America? Or am I seeing more into it than there than there might be? No, I would say that you're seeing a a an angle of that perspective. I like to look at multiple angles. So when you see that when you see that, yes, I believe from my studies and my experiences that gangster rap has been used as an instrument or tool to mm-hmm. to con- to continue uh, the dismantling of black culture for lack of better words miseducation that's what i like absolutely i mean i don't want to i'll be quiet and to let you talk sharing movies like that to me it does continue to perpetuate levels of even if at a subconscious level white supremacy mm-hmm. and that there are whites that exist that desire the subjugation of blacks that's the issue you know uh, and that's what we saw with Get Out. That's what we saw with us. And then Antebellum, you know, I don't know if you want to go see it, but to show what was shown in that film, to know that even modern times, and I think that's where, switching gears briefly, a lot of black people, the the, the pain or the, the 
what's that word I'm looking for? Like, don't play with our intelligence type of deal. America tries to act like it ain't what it is. And that's that's kind of like what I'm saying. People talk about keeping it real and keeping it 100 so much, but so many people just love the blanket of deception, in my opinion. So America would try to act like, well, we're not racist for real. Why should they be bound? Why should they get on a knee at a football game? You should respect the flag. But then you're talking to a veteran like myself who joined the military at 17 years old and went overseas two times only to come home and have multiple white police almost kill me. So it's like, what? Don't, don't, don't play me. You know what I'm saying? If you racist, be racist, say you racist, and let's establish some boundaries and perimeters. But don't act like you ain't when you are then you show the whole world how you are because all of our draws is out in the world to see George Floyd. For right. instance, if this man is not convicted for what he did, you got a whole nother hailstorm. Like America perpetuates this foolishness, but then says, oh, no, we, you know, we're not racist. It's not. And I'm not calling all of America racist. You understand right. what I'm saying? Do you think, it, but, I mean, is, is it wrong to expect them? Or that society, the um, the institutionalized racism, is it wrong to expect someone who represents the establishment to look you in the eye and say, "Oh yeah, we're we're racist. Uh, uh, we we know it." <laughs> you know, it, it's like Malcolm X. I think it was Malcolm X who once said that you could either have the southern wolf or the northern fox. Wow, that's good. That's good. That's they're good. both they're both after you, but one will tell you that they love you and everything is just fine, uh, and then the other one will tell you, no, we have no such pretense. <laughs> I appreciate. I like I like the way you uh, articulated that. Um, for real, man, I think one of the biggest issues, and and I'm glad that you asked this because all of this. All of this matters with with the overall conversation, because when you look at following the money. Back in the day, you had and I'm going to answer that back in the day, you had the conscious rappers who were looking to uplift the black community who brought power to the people. But then it's like, no, we can't have that. Get them out the way. Holes and guns and drugs. That's all y'all need to know about. So once someone of any type of I mean, look at Lauren Hill. Where did Lauren Hill go? The miseducation of Lauren Hill was undoubtedly, even from the industry, one of the greatest albums ever created. Now we got Cardi B. <laughs> now we got yeah. Megan Thee Stallion. Now we got, so it's like, even if it ain't done openly, it's done openly. Who got the eyes to see it? You know, so when you say, when you ask that question, I think a part of the issue is, what do you want us to do? What you want us to do? We're trying to live. We can't even live. We're trying to go to the stove. We get killed at the stove. We're trying to go. Michael Brown went to the stove. He he died. Uh, George Floyd went to the store. He died. Trayvon Martin tried to run away. He died. So I think what happens is either give us a plot, of, and I'm speaking generally, and of course, clearly I can't speak for all black people, but me observing the mindset would be either give us our own land, reestablish black Wall Streets across America, or or we just going to go to war. What, 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 what do you want us to do? Because we're trying to live. You won't let us live. So if you really don't want us here, then for goodness sakes, negotiate with another country or give us a piece of America. Do something, but don't keep doing us like this when we're trying to stay out of your way. That that's my perspective. Right. And I and I don't know if you're familiar with the term blacksit. Have you heard of that? No. Please where, inform me. I mean it clearly sounds like Brexit. Right. But. Yeah, it's a play on that term where many uh African Americans in the US are saying after the George Floyd incident, we've had it with the country. We're going to go ahead and leave the country and go somewhere where if it's not necessarily wow. better, at least it's, you know, we can have quiet. Wow. And that's, wow. A, a, you know, anybody wow. watching or listening can Google the term. 
to learn more about that. And I know that there was an area in Africa, I forget where it was. In where Accra? ACCRA? Accra, that may be it, where some representatives said that it uh, made a statement that they they wanted to welcome uh, people from America saying, look, if this is what you're going through, just going about your business on a daily basis, you're welcome to come here. And um, I don't know for sure, but I think that same person said in an interview that if African-American people applied for citizenship on the wow. basis of, um, you know, the discrim discrimination, um, persecution, religious yeah. and or um, uh, ethnic persecution that they would be allowed in. I don't remember the name or if that's 100% accurate or not, but it's certainly very no, interesting. I've heard of that. I have so, heard of what you're referring to. Where do you see things heading the next 10 years in terms of, you know, the U.S. and the global culture? And where do you see Marquise fitting into things within, say, the next five years? Where do you see yourself headed? That's a great question. I appreciate that, man. That's, that's, I try. That's good. <laughs> Well, in the next 10 years, man, realistically, man, I see a lot of lawlessness, uh, unfolding, unfortunately, with, with, with greater levels of liberation. See, this is, this, and again, everybody has their spiritual beliefs, I understand. But when you look at the overall, America was built off Judeo Christian principles to, to create boundaries of levels of safety. But the more these boundaries fall, the darker natures and desires of man expose themselves, in my personal opinion. So when you see the levels of lawlessness, for instance, I had weed charges from back in the day. Is the new, are the new marijuana charges, are they going to expunge those things from off my record? Like, how does that feel for years now down the road? What you once locked me up for is now legitimate. You know, where's my restitution? I might go and petition for restitution now that we're talking about it and realistically. So watch this. Marijuana is legal. Alcohol is much more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So will cocaine be legal one day? You don't know. You don't know. We only allow grams or half a gram usage for cocaine because our workers need to stay awake or something. Now somebody said, Marquise, you crazy. That don't make no type of sense. But alcohol was prohibited and alcohol, you can drink, you can smoke a blunt and drive from here to, to, to Georgia, and you'd be perfectly fine. Go ahead and drink you a, a, a pint of gin or a fifth of, of, of E&J and try to do the same thing. You've been to kill 20 people on the highway. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when I look at the, for instance, I heard I got to go do some research, but look at how they are blending the gender lines. Look at how they're giving children the okay to say, well, I feel like a girl, so I'm a girl. I feel like I'm a boy, so I'm a boy. They're imposing certain beliefs on them at, at, at a child's age. So me personally, I see more levels of lawlessness, unfortunately. Uh, this George Floyd case really will make or break the start to our summer, I believe, because if it goes south, we gonna see some we gonna see some issues. If they don't convict this man, we're gonna see some issues. Uh, we're gonna have to see, you know, uh we got a new presidency, new administration, so we'll see if they're gonna uphold what they said they're gonna do. So those things will matter. And as you know, what happens in America affects other cultures, um, uh, and vice versa. We'll see what's gonna happen with the COVID now that everybody's getting their vaccinations. Uh, you know, we saw the restrictions that took place. So the next 10 years, we got Elon Musk, we got Bitcoin hitting a high, high rate, greater levels of, of digital currency becoming a greater reality in our world. You know, we got chips in our cards. I had a chip in my card in 2004, Dave. I've been saw this technology because mm -hmm. I was in the military. We've been had cards. So, I mean, that was 14 years ago. So. Uh, we got Alexa, we got uh, Ring software, everything's interconnected with the internet. 
I, I think it's going to be a wild ride, man. I really do. For the next 10 years, I really do. Between everything that I just named, uh, having to possibly have COVID passports. What if you don't want to get the vaccination? So now they're, they're literally, look, look at that. Look at that. You don't want to get the vaccination. So now they're saying you can't leave the country. Like that, those are greater levels of policing. Now a person can say, well, you should want to keep everybody safe. You should want to blah, blah, blah. Well, no disrespect, honey. I wrote the book on it. I know the full ramifications of what propaganda is. When you have the CDC coming to tell you that they manipulated numbers, how should I then believe you? I'm just saying, I'm just saying, this is not Dave's point of view. This is Marquis. I'm just saying, if your government body, who's supposed to be the governing authority on diseases and things of that nature, openly tell you, I'm sorry, we manipulated the numbers, then how can I then obey or how can I then trust what you put out after that? Why should I when I don't know many people personally, not to make this a COVID argument, but I'm just painting the whole picture. I don't know people really that have passed away from it that were completely 100% healthy. Most people that you've heard had compromised immune systems who maybe did not tell you that they had compromised immune systems. But most absolutely healthy individuals, it came and it left. So if it's so darn deadly, I'm just saying, no disrespect to Dave or his audience, I just want America to think. Well, let me just say that I can understand your perspective as far as COVID is concerned and the vaccination uh passports so far what's happening is that it's extremely disorganized at best um and you have states uh, such as florida that are saying we're not going to participate in anything like that um and i and i will say that i i may have had uh covid because i did go through something where i had a fever of 104 I uh-huh. could not get up without getting dizzy for a while. Um, you know, it was extremely stressful. I didn't know what was going to happen. And um, I had never experienced anything like that before. So if that was a mild case of COVID, I don't want a full blown one. I couldn't even, I couldn't, I tried to hold a cup of tea in my hand and I was shivering so bad. I was about to drop it. It was that bad. I couldn't hold the cup because I had such bad shivers uh, that 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 particular time. So I want to give you your freedom of expression, but I also want to encourage people, you know, if you have doubts it. about uh, COVID, you know, do the research, look uh, at, at, at information that's objective as well, so you can get a full picture as far as that, because we are in the middle of a global pandemic right now, 500,000 plus people. The the CDC did a lot that they could have done better. That being said, I just wanted, I feel an obligation to say every other country is experiencing uh, issues, you know, with COVID. Uh, So I just want to say that to anybody out there who's, you know, a COVID denier or thinks it's not really happening. Uh, I'm of the mindset that I do believe COVID is real. And I do believe that, that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are passing away or even worse suffering from it. So I just want to say that. Um, But I do respect your opinion and your uh, uh, thoughts on, on what's going on. Everybody should question authority. They should question what they're being told and look at things from multiple viewpoints. Would you agree with that? I do. Um, and again, um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the way you handled that truly. And I, I do speak from, from various levels of experience. Again, being an Iraqi vet, I took the anthrax shot um, years ago. And then I took an anthrax nasal drip, which was a new, which was new. <laughs> Let's try this right. new nasal drip in country and had immediate adverse reaction to it. But mm. even in my inner man, I was, and I didn't even know about all this stuff yet, but 
but I was kind of fighting with my SARS. Like, SARS, I, ain't, I, I don't feel right about that. I don't know about that. I'm not trying to take this. I'm not taking it. And he was going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then, of course, he had to threaten your money. Not that it was him, but he said, you know, they going to take your pay if you don't want to get in line and do what you need to do. So against my better judgment, I took the nasal drip, and within 30 minutes, I was feeling jacked up. I was dizzy. I felt weak. I felt sick. I felt crazy. And I said, Sarge, I told you I didn't want to take it. He was like, go sleep, rest it off. And by God's grace, I woke up fine. So, uh, you know, I've had, I have varying experiences in which I make certain statements. But again, I'm not saying that it's not real. I just, that, that was were just my perspective. As right. you say, question what you're seeing, question what you're hearing. You know, don't just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. Do some research so that you can make the best uh, choice for you and your family. Right. And I would say also, as far as getting information, one of the things that I try to do, just as an aside for information, one of the things that I try to do on a daily basis is there's a great website, and I don't get any money from them in any way. There's a website called RefDesk, R-E-F-D-E-S-K.com. And what I try to do is uh, in the morning while I'm having my morning tea or my morning monster or what have you, I will go through that website and it's an aggregate and it lists all the headlines of all major, nice. uh, all major uh, U.S. news sources, both left and right and objective. Okay. So you can see what's going on and get a full um, understanding. And then... Obviously, if you look at the BBC, you look at yeah. the news in Australia and Canada and, you know, other major countries, you can really get a good understanding of what's really going on, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So if you go to Raff and Desk and then maybe go to Google News, news.google.com, and just look up the news for Spain, Italy, Canada, U.K., just go okay. through the top headlines. And, you know, you can get a pretty uh, well-rounded understanding of what's going on, but also you can see how some networks are going to taint the news to the little bit to the right, and some are going to taint it to the left, but you can get a more robust understanding. So I'll leave it at that. But Marquise, I want to thank you for your time. Do you have, I really any, appreciate it. Do you have any parting thoughts or uh, any any comments that you would like to articulate before we conclude? Uh, one, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my opinions are my opinions and my perspectives. They come through prayer, through sacrifice, through living these things. At the end of the day, I want people to experience a, a better quality of life. Uh, trauma is real. Trauma is a part of our lives, but there are better ways of living. And I believe that if you acknowledge these truths, what I call truths and, and just look at these perspectives that I've shared, I believe that they'll show you something. I believe that you'll see, well, you know, I, I didn't consider it that way. I didn't look at it that way. I've been, by God's grace, able to to change the way a lot of people think when they started to look at it the way I was sharing it to them. I call it a conscious interrupt. They start to see things a little differently. And um, I've experienced it with my own home and my own family. Other people in my circle, those that have been following me for many years on social media, um, it has impacted them. So the work is strenuous. The work is is definitely something that's fought against, but it's my calling, and I'm here to do it. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, I appreciate you sharing your journey with our viewers and listeners. I appreciate your time, and I hope that that journey will continue and continue to evolve and have even greater depth and meaning for you in the years to come. So thank you again. Please stick around with me for a few minutes. And for anybody watching or listening out there, if you've enjoyed this video or this audio podcast, please consider giving it a good review, like it, download it, tell your friends about it and subscribe and uh, continue to watch and consume our videos and audio podcasts. So thank you very much, everybody, and take care.
Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.